How many of you here today know who this is? That's a shame. Stanislav Petrov saved the world. He was on duty during a particularly tense period in 1983 in US-Soviet relations when the radar system registered a US missile launch, then a second, then a third, then a fourth and a fifth. He kept calm. He radioed in a false alarm based purely on his conviction that the US wouldn't start a war with just five missiles. He was right, and he was congratulated at first. Then he was interrogated extensively, then reprimanded, and then left the military shortly afterwards. You might know who these two guys are. They squared up during 1962 over Cuba and nearly brought the world into nuclear war. The most dangerous moment in human history, or so they say. What about this guy? As late as January 1995, Boris Yeltsin had the nuclear briefcase open in front of him because of a Norwegian weather rocket, just like this. And it's not just in the, um, Russia that this has happened. It's been in the US too, many times, due to faulty computer chips, weather rockets, even large flocks of geese. JFK's Secretary of Defense said that it was luck that kept uh, us from nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, we've been lucky far, far too often. My name's Sean O'Hagerty. I'm managing a program to set up a Center for the Study of Existential Risk in Cambridge. We define an existential risk as one that threatens to wipe out humanity or drastically and permanently damage our future prospects. Existential risks from nature have always been with us. This is the Chicxulub crater, where it's believed that 66 million years ago, a meteor struck the Earth, killing three quarters of all life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Toba supervolcano eruption 70,000 years ago is nearly, uh, nearly wiped out humanity. But these are rare events. One in 100,000 years for supervolcanoes, millions of years apart for really large impacts from uh, meteors. We think humanity has more pressing concerns. On July 16, 1945, the history of the world changed utterly with the Trinity atomic bomb test. For the first time in the 45 million centuries of the Earth's history, one species had the power over the future of the Earth, depending on the decisions it made or the mistakes. And this is power that we've only just got and that we're only just trying to learn to control. The fate of generations ahead of us, countless generations ahead of us, depend on how we handle this period of history, the period of history that we're living in right now. Here are a few of the people I work with. On the left, Jan Tallinn, a software owner who brought the world Kazan Skype. In the middle, Martin Rees, the UK's astronomer Royale. On the right, Hugh Price, a philosopher. Each of them has brought his own success in different fields together to focus on the challenge of technological risk. And we've had a formidable array of people sign up to help. Here are just a couple of them. Synthetic biologists like George Church of Harvard, who has famously said that his work should be under surveillance. Artificial intelligence experts like Stuart Russell and Margaret Bowden, physicists like Stephen Hawking, economists like Parha Dasgupta, policy experts like Susan Owens. And of course, it's not just us. There are people all over the world, thousands of them, working on specific areas within technological risk, whose research and expertise we'll be drawing on. But what kind of risks are we concerned about? I've talked about nuclear weapons. There's growing concern over developments in engineered biology, synthetic biology, related biotechnologies. In particular, the kinds of technologies that would allow small groups of people to develop brand new globe-spanning diseases. 
artificial intelligence, perhaps not the way Hollywood paints it, but experts in the field think that we should be very careful about how we develop this technology in the coming century. Geoengineering. This is deliberate human interventions to change the Earth's climate. Not being done yet, but research is being done into it. Advances in the future in molecular manufacturing, a way ahead of what we're able to do now, but worth looking into. And then there are the unknowns, technologies that we can't see right now from where we stand in history, but that will change the world as completely as the internet has in recent decades, or that nuclear weapons did when they entered global warfare. So what will be the characteristics of these new risks? First of all, they will be new. We will not have centuries, not even decades to study them. If we're smart and forward looking, we may have years, but we'll need every day of that. They won't be rare. We've come closer to wiping ourselves out in the last 50 years than we have in the 50,000 years before that. They will be varied. They will come from different sciences, different industries. They will need different approaches and different steps to mitigate them. They could be due to deliberate actions, such as war or terrorism. They could be due to errors, such as accidentally releasing a dangerous organism or an artificial intelligence. Or they could be due to the result of unintended consequences of actions and processes that seem benign in themselves, like we're seeing with climate change at the moment. They will be incredibly difficult to regulate. We're perhaps lucky we live in a universe where the laws of physics don't allow a disgruntled teenager to build a nuke in his or her bedroom. That won't be the case with every technology we develop. Already, the technologies needed to modify the genomes of organisms are getting cheaper and cheaper and more and more widespread. And the information becomes the limiting thing. And controlling information, stopping the flow of information that people want, is incredibly difficult. Control. These technologies may allow greater and greater control over our environment, over our future, to fall into smaller and smaller numbers of hands. Or in the case of artificial intelligence, take it right out of our hands. Speed. Developments might be very, very fast. So we need to be prepared. This may seem like an impossible challenge. It's not, but it's hard. What it does need is a new approach, a new science, which combines more disciplines, more backgrounds, more insights than ever before. Unexpected connections can be remarkably powerful. Let me show you how. Let's zoom in on one risky technology, synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is the design and construction of biological organisms for purposes useful to humans. Building living things to be useful tools and biofactories for us. The potentials are still in the future, but they're enormous. Medicine, biofuels, uh, every sort of construction, you name it. But the risks are also great. They might allow a small group to develop um, a pandemic that would decimate the world's population, or an accidental release of an organism could cause an ecological disaster. Synthetic biology already builds on advances in a number of different fields, from synthetic chemistry to molecular biology to DNA synthesis and sequencing to computer-aided um, design and modeling. So to understand what's in the future for synthetic biology, we need to understand what's going on in these um, different enabling technologies which means bridging the gap between experts in all these areas. But we need more than that. Synthetic biology is one of the fascinating paradigms of the 21st century, where the interplay between information and physical creation gets tighter and tighter, and information becomes a crucial thing. We're already starting to see a precursor of this with um, 3D printing. The US is trying to restrict the spread of cat files allowing 3D printed guns, and is finding it really, really hard. So information becomes dangerous, and the information um, involved in synthetic biology could be much more dangerous than that. So where do we find people who know anything about information flow? Well, the computer security people have been doing this for a long time. They may not know, have all the answers, but they know the problem. They know what obvious solutions not to try, what obvious things won't work. Most of all, they know that the problem is hard. Sometimes knowing a problem is hard is a big deal in and of itself. But we need more than that. 
as these, culture, um, as these technologies spread, we need to find ways of developing a culture of safe uh, and responsible innovation. Now, that means understanding how people think, what their motivations are. And that's where the social scientists come in. Uh, the Synthetic Biology LEAP program is just one example of really good work already in this area. But we need more than that as well. We need safe, enforceable regulations. And if we're going to make rules like that, we need lessons from the legal community on what will actually work. And we need lessons from industry on what they'll accept and what will fly. And we need more again. We need to work hand in hand with government and policymakers so that they have the information they need to make um, proper legislation and good policy. And we need to understand what they're able to do and what's outside of their power. Lastly, we need insights from the hacker community. Whatever rules we make, we need to know how people are going to break them. So let's zoom out again. We need all of these different unexpected connections just to get somewhere with this one technology. But we need a layer on top of that again. We need to be able to look across the technological landscape and say, this is getting enough attention, this is flying under the radar, we need to focus attention on that. And it's on these kind of questions and the ones before, that's where we come in at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. We'll be building on the work of our sister institute at Oxford, the Future of Humanity Institute. And here's a little of what we're going to do. Horizon scanning. We need as much time as possible to prepare for these challenges, which means looking to the edge of the horizon as far as we can sensibly predict, and sometimes even a little beyond that. So we're going to work with the um, top people in the world who are working on technological and scientific forecasting. We will use the best methods for this at the moment and adapt them for technological um, risk long range. We'll also develop our own methodologies and we'll speak to the people in these specific fields who are doing the most interesting work, the most far-reaching work, and ask them what we should be worried about. Engaging with technologies. We'll have specific sub um, teams working on these different technologies and members of those teams will spend periods embedded with leading tech development facilities, not just to understand what's going on at the coalface, but also to understand the culture within these technologies, how they feel about progress, about safety, about regulations, even about whistleblower culture. Forming bridges. None of this will work unless we have communication and cooperation between different disciplines and research, outside of research industry, government and the public. We'll build those bridges. Whether it's at conferences, at cabinet meetings, or over pints in the pub, we'll make sure that the people who need to talk to each other are talking to each other. Lastly, a general methodology. Every technology we look at will need specific approaches, but we'll also learn general lessons and general approaches for future challenges. Humanity is going to be doing this for a long time. And every time we overcome one challenge, we need to be better prepared for the next one. The most important thing I want you to know is none of this is hopeful or aspirational. The most heartening and encouraging thing for me about going into this field is finding out how many allies we have. People in scientific research think this is valuable research and want to help. People in industry think this is valuable and want to help. People in government have been reaching out to us in the UK, in the US, and across Europe, and they want to engage, they want to listen. And the media even like us. I particularly like they might be an unlikely group of superheroes. And we're really only getting started. When I first entered this field, I was intimidated by the enormity, the impossibility of this challenge. I don't feel that way now. When you combine insights and brilliant work from brilliant people across a range of different disciplines, you can overcome even the greatest challenges. And you need these unexpected connections, because if it's a complex problem, if you don't consider every angle, you'll miss something essential that changes the whole picture. We muddled through the challenge of existential risk from technology before this. We muddled through the challenge of nuclear weapons based on luck. We cannot afford to keep being lucky. Existential risk from technology will be the defining challenge of the 21st century. 
and the stakes could not be higher. But we're all in this together, and that's what makes me most hopeful. Thank you.